Hi, uh, welcome everyone for uh, people who are seeing us on uh, through the Zoom and like on the YouTube uh, feed. Welcome to Quetch, um, which is a speaker series that originally began with a convening by the People's Tribune. And um, it was through conversations with many frontline groups um, across the country to originally plan uh, one panel on water, but through like multiple conversations, um, through multiple conversations, like we really felt like we really needed to, this needed to be a series. And um, this is actually sponsored by multiple organizations, including the People's Tribune, Tribune del Pueblo, People's Water Board, Flint Democracy, the Fence League, our Illinois Revolution, Denmark Citizens, for Safe Water, Youth for Public Health and Social Justice, and Walk Around the World for Water, and many more organizations across the country. Um, tonight's panel is Other Toxins in Water, and we our panels are the fourth um, Thursday of the month. And um, and if you have any questions as you as you hear the testimony of the, the following people, please put them in the Q and A, and they will be time at the end to um, answer those. Um, and then also, if you're watching this through YouTube, please put them in the chat, and they will be compiled and um, put forth to the panelists at the end. Thank you. And I'm turning it over to Sherry, sorry. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Nayara, thank you. Um, I just want to thank the People's Tribune for offering us this platform to speak, you know, on a national level to get the word out there um, that we're having issues everywhere. Um, my name is Sherry Straub, and I am the founder of a grassroots organization called Clean Water Now. Um, I grew up in Lake Erie and experienced water issues there. And returning to Florida, I realized very soon that we were having the same issues here. Um, we, the issues that we have here is, is lengthy. It's not just one issue or another. So I brought some really good panelists on this evening to have a discussion about what's in our water. Um, everybody's asking, you know, is it safe? You know, is it good for our health? Um, so uh, my first guest um, is Scott Wilson. Scott Wilson, probably with the people in Florida, doesn't need too much of an introduction because Scott's out there with Mike Nepper and they're doing videos and they're exposing the raw truth of what's really going on um, with the sprain. Scott was actually a guest that we had had on a previous webinar um, uh, with uh, um, Agent Orange versus We the People, We the People versus Agent Orange. Sorry, I had that backwards. Um, and it, it talked about the aerial spraying and Scott hit it right out of the park. So Scott's been um, monitoring the water since 1988. And as I said, he's teamed up with Mike Nepper and they've got some great environmental videos out there. And Scott would be the first guest that I'd like to introduce tonight. Scott? Oh, good evening, Sherry. And I want to thank everyone for this opportunity to be heard because uh, a lot of people just really don't understand what's happening. And uh, first, I want to throw out a big disclaimer. Uh, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a biologist. Um, I'm a retired pastor and business owner. Uh, I'm a lifelong commercial charter and sport fisherman. I tried to add it up all at one time and came up with over 100,000 lifetime water hours. So, um, I'm a generational homeowner on the Kissimmee chain of lakes. Uh, I currently spend about five to 600 annual hours on the Central Florida Lake. Uh, because of my outspokenness, I've been educated by some of the tightest water mines in Florida. Uh, I've been able to ride the large scale mechanical harvesters and uh, I've, I've done my homework over the last few years. But uh, that is my disclaimer. And uh, 
to start, Florida is in real trouble, real trouble. Um, you know, we have a lot of things going on. We have exponential population growth. We have issues with septic and sewage systems. We have the totality of big agriculture. We have phosphate mining. We have a, a lot of really serious pollution loading sources in Florida. And a, a main pollution loading source has been self-imposed and it is the, uh, uh, the chemical aquatic application of herbicides to control invasive aquatic plants. And not only those herbicides, but pesticides and insecticides that are being used by developers. You have every county, every municipality, you have uh, homeowners now, almost all have a jug of Roundup in their, in their garage. We have golf courses, lawn maintenance companies, the Florida Department of Transportation, Army Corps. Uh, we got uplands plant management. We got the entirety of Florida agriculture that are all spraying these herbicides, but the most direct is the herbicides that are being put directly into the water to control in what they call invasive aquatic vegetation. You know, per a 2005 FWC conference, it's noted that Florida is the largest consumer of aquatic herbicides anywhere on the planet. I first heard that, that blew me away. In Florida, we have 17 approved chemical classes and many that are much worse than glyphosate. Um, these chemicals are sprayed daily. I've witnessed this well over 40 years. They're sprayed daily via a massive fleet of airboats. The chemicals are now directly injected using weighted hoses called subsurface injection, and they are broadcast across Florida from helicopters. And they're used to control invasive hyacinth, water lettuce, and especially hydrilla, which is a fast growing exceptional natural filter. And see, the thing is, is that in Florida, as these nutrient loads continually um, uh, increase, it causes exponential growth because of the nutrients in the water of, of these invasive plants. And it requires continuous spraying and it's cr created this continuous cycle of chemicals. And um, our fight, has been for large uh, areas of managed and then mechanically harvested plants that naturally filter water. And then these plants, um, when they're removed mechanically, take the sequestered legacy ni uh, nitrogen and phosphorus out of the water systems. With these uh, modern large scale harvesters, uh, aquatic plant harvesters, it's not only feasible to do this versus chemicals, but it's also competitive price-wise. And we've even proven that uh, uh, with the most, most treated plant in Florida, the, the most money is spent treating a plant called hydrilla. It actually costs less per acre per treatment to mechanically remove these plants from the lakes rather than to spray them with continually with chemicals. These toxic herbicides have had a residual effect of absolutely wiping out the lower food chain in our lakes, and especially on the Kissimmee chain of lakes, which is the headwaters for the entire Kissimmee, Okeechobee, Everglades system. The frogs, the sirens, um, grass shrimp, insect larvae, shad, shiners, you know, all these lower food chain fishes are, and, and, and creatures are, are, they're literally, they're gone on many of these, these lakes that have been treated for a long period of time. Also now we've come to find out that poor water quality from years of spraying has created deep muck layers for decades. And then these deep muck layers have so degraded water quality that in uh, the immune systems of, of, of sport fish like bass and, and crappie, their immune systems have been impaired and it's leading to the, these bulging tours, tumors. And I know you've seen many, I've, I've collected hundreds and caught dozens personally of these bulging tumored fish and bacterial infections that I've never seen in my life. Um, it's also noted that nearly 100% of these bacterial uh, infections are, are nearly 100% fatal to largemouth bass. And that comes per direct quote from FWC, Florida Wildlife Commission's top biologist. You know, starting south of Orlando, 
The Kissimmee Chain of Lakes is the northernmost headwaters of the Kissimmee Okeechobee Everglades system. And these nutrients are flushed down south annually. And they're increasing the, the phosphorus loads in Lake Okeechobee to about 160 parts per billion. And this is feeding massive algal blooms in Lake Okeechobee. The water's then flushed out to both coasts. And then this feeds the red tide and the saltwater algal blooms. And we know in 2018, we had massive saltwater fish kills. You know, the outgassing from this blue-green algae, the cyanobacteria and the red tide has been proven very toxic to not only humans and animals. Um, we now have had a, a massive turtle die off in the freshwater lakes. And most recently, people have probably read that manatees are, are, are dying by the hundreds in never before seen numbers. And with the manatees that they've tested, they've all tested with high levels of lifespan. You know, it's all directly connected. What people may not understand is that water quality in Central Florida, just south of Orlando, directly affects water quality through Lake Okeechobee, through the entire Everglades water system, out into Florida Bay, and even directly affects water quality along the reef track system of the Florida Keys and then back up the East Coast. And um, as the nutrient loads continue to increase in the watershed, we need more, not less aquatic plants. We need these plants to filter the water. And one of the big problems is Florida lakes primarily are shallow water lakes. Very few of them are more than about 10 or 12 feet deep. So when we have even, even mild storm winds of 30 or 40 miles an hour, those winds turn these shallow Florida lakes upside down and it resuspends these legacy nutrients that have collected in these three foot muck layers back into the water column, refeeding these algaes and the cycle starts all over again. It's a vicious cycle. You know, this, this, this aquatic plant management program in Florida started with good intentions to keep navigational trails clear, but it's expanded exponentially in the last 11 years with these application contracts that have been given to, to private contractors that then get reimbursed by the gallon. For three years, I've now freely guided documentarians, including an Emmy winner, news crews, including CNN, which... Bill Weir's story got 26 million views on Lake Okeechobee that I, that I helped guide for. We've uh, drone spray video of these spray crews undeniably chasing and purposely spraying wildlife with acidic contact poison. And uh, now, just for a note, the favorite uh, chemical, one of the favorite chemicals in Florida is called diquat dibromide. And now this has just recently been proven to be responsible for the mass bald eagle die off across the entire Southeast United States. And now it even gets worse. We have the two most used products in Florida, endothal and diquat, most used in Florida for this aquatic plant management that come directly from Wuhan. And people say, what, no way. But yes, they come directly from a company called United Phosphorus, another company called Syngenta Chemical, and these companies are both owned by a Chinese national company called Kim China Inc. And these people, these are Sagenta Chemicals and, and, and UPL, they provided hundreds of millions of dollars to the University of Florida IFAS, which are, provides the science for aquatic plant management in Florida. Hundreds of millions in grants and internships and uh, provided all the in-house science to get DE approval and the other bad thing is these chemicals all come, almost every one of them come with at least 50% trade secret ingredients. And the FWC has already admitted that in meetings when they were, when they were grilled that they don't know what they've been putting in the water for 40 years. Lastly, the government regula regulatory agency responsible for all this, the Florida Wildlife Commission and the Florida Department of Environmental Protection are set up with illegally obtained constitutional rule authority, not the intended statutory authority, meaning the law that they put together, this Aquatic Weed Control Act, is the same thing as a constitutional amendment in Florida. And what they've done in this process is they've denied all Floridians any type of due process or any type of ability to challenge these aquatic spray laws in any course, uh, in any court. 
the only options to save Florida right now, in my opinion, are large managed areas of mechanically harvested plants and drawdowns and scrapings like they've done in years past, removing this toxic muck out of the, the Florida surface watershed. Unity of Florida water groups has proven to be nearly impossible. All these different groups have their own pet peeves of what they believe these pollution loading sources are. I agree, there's a perfect storm. It's not just the spring. There is a multitude of pollution loading sources. But no matter what people believe the pollution loading source is, large amounts of managed aquatic plants, when they're periodically removed and taking these legacy nutrients out of the water system, it filters the water, it removes nutrients, and it addresses all the pollution loading sources. So we have answers. We just don't have the governmental will to implement these answers. And uh, in the words of an old Warren Zebon song, if anybody's listening, we need lawyers, guns, and money. <laughs> so that's it for me. You're muted, Sherry. Yeah. I'm not here. Yeah, thank you. Scott, thank you very much. Let me try this again. Um, sorry, if, sorry if I went too far over. No, you did it. You did good. I really appreciate all the information that you give us at any time. Um, you put in your whole heart in. That's what's needed out there is people that are going to get out there and and talk about it. When you started posting the pictures of the fish and the tumors that they had, and when I looked at the diagram and sent that to you that day, it was like me looking in a mirror. It was like I was the fish in paradise, like the canary in the coal mine because of the health issues that I have. And, you know, like I said, you know, we're not doctors. We're not scientists, we're the average daily person, and that's the people that are gonna make a difference. Um, our next guest I'd like to bring on um, is George Cutting. And if you know George Cutting in Florida, George doesn't ever, um, George puts it right out there. And that's one of the things that I really like about him. And he's really smart and educated and he's self-educated. Um, he gets down to the nitty gritty, but yet explains it to you in a way that you can understand it. Um, George has a group, it's called Clean Water Activists and Citizen Scientists. And he's definitely a concerned stakeholder um, and independent researcher. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to George now. And George, can you tell us a little bit about what's in our water in layman's terms so people can kind of understand it a little bit better and kind of play off of what Scott had mentioned because you guys are excellent together. I appreciate it. All right, well, thank you very much for letting me uh, come on here and talk. Um, Scott uh, talked about a lot of the issues with the herbicide applications um, and a lot of the resistance that he's getting met with uh, when trying to address these issues going towards the state um, or any other agency that's supposed to be, you know, about conservation like the FWC. And um, it, it seems very uh, frustrating and very confusing when they talk about these herbicide applications. Um, you know, as, as Scott has mentioned, uh, they go through and they spray and then the lake turns into muck and then you get the algae blooms. And on the flip side, the state and a lot of these agencies are saying that they're using the herbicides to control the blooms. Um, when I did a lot of the research, because things weren't lining up, you know, when you come against things like that, you start questioning uh, what you're hearing and what you're seeing, because it just doesn't come together. Um, I found that a lot of these chemical herbicides are actually instigating the algae blooms. Um, now, through some of the research that I was doing, I was finding that uh, there's plenty of research 
surrounding the algae and the bacteria that are in the water that these herbicides actually support um, and help grow. And when you look at the difference between aquatic foliage in a lake and a bacterial dominated lake that you know that's contaminated with different types of pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, uh, you know, there's a long list of different things that these bacteria um, and uh, algae can actually break these components, these contaminants down. Um, one of the things I did when I started looking at all this and it didn't make sense, I had started asking the state, went to the um, South Florida Water Management District, uh, FWC. I was asking for the back tests for the herbicide uh, applications. Now, what that is, is it's the bacterial tests uh, that these herbicide applications have to go through. Basically, they'll apply it and then they take a look at the soil or the, the sediment to see what, what type of bacteria um, uh, are left behind or are encouraged after application. Now, I have not gotten a response back uh, from them. It seems like they're putting up a stone wall about giving me this information. So without having that complete information from them or, or transparency, uh, that drove me a little bit further just to keep going and, and trying to understand what they're doing. Um, as Scott had mentioned, we have multiple pollution sources uh, around the state. You know, we've got uh, agriculture surrounding Lake Okeechobee, uh, up through the Kissimmee uh, chain of lakes. Uh, we also have issues with residential um, septic systems. And then we also have something that not very many people talk about is the contribution of contamination from ASR wells. Um, you know, this is where you start getting into uh, not just groundwater or um, surface water chemistry, you get into groundwater chemistry and also its bacteriological uh, components. Um, I did notice that between the trying to get more clean water, because that's what they're setting us up for to provide for this exponential growth uh, that we're going through, we need more than just a reservoir in the middle of the lake to supply water for the entire Southern watershed. Now they're implementing these ASR wells, but the only water we have to put down in the ground is dirty. And when it comes back out, it's dirty. Um, a lot of different mineral and, and bacterial contaminants travel with that water. Um, and it's not good enough just to clean it under what they have available to them now. And that interaction between that groundwater and our polluted surface water is also instigating blooms. Now, through some of my research, I realized that these aquatic herbicide applications and shifting the lake to a microbial dominant system is a way to stabilize the lake and kind of control the way these happen uh, or the interactions happen. Now, I'm sure most of you know that throughout history, every time we try to put a finger in mother nature, it always seems to backfire on us. Um, nothing we ever seem to do, uh, at least in the long run, uh, we can't seem to, to overcompensate for, you know, whatever billions of years of evolution that has happened. There's always a, a bounce back, um, usually in a, in a negative direction uh, when we try to start molding things to, to what we need. Um, and like Scott was saying, you know, if we let the aquatic um, vegetation grow back, we have a more stable lake. You know, he also mentioned when you get these windstorms at 30, 40 miles an hour or a, or a hurricane, where you're getting now 60, 70, 80 mile an hour winds, it stirs up the lake. Well, a lot of the aquatic vegetation helps to stabilize that muck. And, you know, it, it will keep that turbidity down. Now that does on the flip side, lower the amount of light that reaches the sediment. Um, but maybe for their aquatic management, their aquatic uh, foliage, foliage management, maybe they should consider compartmentalizing the lake and breaking it down or throughout different parts of the watershed, which they seem to, seem to have done since 2018, but nowhere near the level it needs to be done so they can actually hinder these algae blooms and get that nutrient sequestering through the aquatic uh, foliage 
and then remove it mechanically. Um, I think overall, I think the project leans favors microbial degradation and control of the waterways through microbes and also moving nutrients through as one big bioremediation strategy. Um, we do have exponential growth going on down here. We do need more clean water. Um, you know, the contaminants that I'm finding, the degradation of all these legacy pollutants in the, the sediment uh, create a, a storm of different compounds that come our way. And on top of that, because of the micro, uh, microbial degradation, now you get all these microbial enzymes and, and many people know when you look at these, you can see there, these are the basis to pharmaceuticals that have negative effects on us. Some of these compounds have been used for, actually injected into animals for cancer research actually induce cancer and then see what the outcome is of that. So I almost feel like I'm living in a big test tube uh, down here on the Southwest coast of Florida. Um, it's, we are the, the, the bottom end of where the, the multitude or the, the bulk of the discharge is coming down through the Kissimmee chain of lakes, through Lake Okeechobee. It's coming right out to our coast down here on the Southwest coast. Um, and I'm not excited with what I'm seeing and there's, there's many different uh, aspects to what's going on that really make it seem dismal, uh, especially for the long run, for the long haul. So. Oh, you're muted again. Uh, thank you very much, George. Um, I appreciate you jumping on with us. Um, if I ever have any questions, George, you know you're always my go-to person um, because you help me figure things out. And that's, we have a lot of issues here in Florida that I didn't realize um, how big the issues were until, um, like I said, you know, I had lived in Ohio and we had had problems there with Lake Erie and the cyanobacteria and moving down here, back down to Florida in 2016, when they said that, you know, we had cyanobacteria back in the Caloosahatchee River, I just like freaked out because I knew how sick it made people up there. And, you know, they're talking about data collection and things like that. And, you know, we need to research this. And it's like, you know, we need to look to the North because these people have been researching it for a long time. And it's been really nice because I see a lot of the researchers from that area are coming down here. But then, you know, it makes me wonder, you know, are, are we the test dummies? So, you know, it made me look at all of the different issues that we were having and, you know, what's the solution? Because there were so many and so many different levels that, you know, it, it made me look at it a little bit differently. And that's when I found um, the rights of nature. They, you know, with the Lake Erie Bill of Rights and they had, you know, started in the, uh, an initiative up there. And it was something that I knew that would work within a lot of different communities for a lot of different issues. Um, you know, so what do we do? You know, bury our heads in the sand and hope for the best? Um, or do we take a stand for our, our communities and our children and our grandchildren and, you know, our ecosystem? I mean, our, our environment depends on it. Um, our next guest, um, I'd like to introduce, she is one of my sheroes. I cannot tell you enough about this lady. Um, she comes to us from Ohio. Her name is Susie, and I know I'm going to slaughter this because I don't say it right all the time, Berensdorf. Susie is a teacher, a geologist, a tree planner, and she does live in Youngstown, Ohio. Um, Susie is a co-founder of Frack Free Mahoney Valley and the Youngstown Community Bill of Rights Committee. She also helped put eight local citizens initiative campaigns on the ballot from 2013 to 2018. Of course, the campaigns lost due to outside corporate money and influence in the false narratives of jobs versus the environment. Susie is a very outspoken advocate for the community rights and the rights of nature, and she does represent Mahoney County for the Ohio Community Rights Network. 
OHCRN. She is also a, the volunteer president for the National Community Rights Network, um, a central resource for advancing a movement for local self-government through community rights. I'd like to turn it over to Susie now. Thank you, Susie, for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Sherry. And it's been great uh, meeting uh, the other people um, organizing this event. And I, I watched the last two uh, videos, the Quench webinars one and two, and you know found them very engaging. And I'm excited about meeting new people. So um, I'll just tell you a little bit about the whole story, the way that uh, it has evolved. Uh, I've lived in Youngstown for 28 years. I grew up in Bakersfield, California in an oil tool service company, I mean, uh, family, and got my degree in geology and then worked as a mud logger in the oil and gas fields of California in the 80s. Now, in 2010, a friend gave me a Vanity Fair magazine article about fracking, and I read it and I thought, boy, this is not the, the drilling agenda that I, you know, have been exposed to all my life. Um, then in late 2010, there was an Earthworks conference in Pittsburgh um, where there were a lot of, you know, the big names, but I didn't know any of the, the you know, anti-fracking names. Uh, but Pittsburgh had just banned fracking in their city uh, with one of the first uh, community bill of rights. They did, uh, they did it through their city council. So it wasn't a citizen initiative, but it was a council uh, passed uh, ban on fracking in the city of Pittsburgh. So that was a big win. Uh, in 2011, earthquakes began shaking up the city of Youngstown, and um, they continued throughout 2011 with a 3.9 on New Year's Eve of 2011, which, you know, shook everyone up. And uh, we ended up having a meeting with over 500 people about 10 days later. And our uh, Ohio Department of Natural Resources uh, showed a PowerPoint about the history of oil and gas in Ohio and where people, you know, all they wanted to know was, why are we having the earthquakes? How are you going to stop them? And what are you going to do about our property damage? Because there were, you know, certainly cracked walls and, you know, different foundational things. I do know a person that worked at the water department said there were uh, more water leaks. And, uh, you know, we live in an old city of, uh, you know, a lot of brick. And I grew up in California where there were earthquakes that we expected more, but not back here in, uh, in Ohio. So that's when our group uh, formed Frack Free Mahoning Valley and tried to navigate uh, the system that we thought, you know, was working for us. Uh, then we found deep drilling rights had been sold under our precious Mill Creek Park. We found that there were four frack wells drilled in our drinking water protection area of the reservoir that serves uh, 220,000 people, uh, their drinking water. And so we just tires, tirelessly then kept contacting our electeds and writing our legislators and speaking at park board and township and city meetings you know, attending rallies, signing petitions, organizing town halls, uh, requesting public records. I think you probably all submitting public comments, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, there were some, uh, some in our group that would do some blockading and get arrested. And, um, you know, we try to, you know, all different things, but phew, you know, we call this the hamster wheel. Uh, or the box of allowable actions that, that our governmental system, our fixed system allows us to do. You know, it feels like you're, like you're getting something done when you're writing letters and you're talking to officials and that kind of thing. Um, so, but in 2012, we found CELDEF, the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, and we began having discussions with Ben Price. And one of his first statements was, we don't just have a fracking problem, we have a democracy problem. And you can, you know, put anything in that blank. We don't, you know, we don't just have a, you know, water foliage spraying problem, you know, we have a democracy problem. Um, so uh, we started with trying to have our city council uh, pass an ordinance to ban fracking in our city, but of course, 
uh, it was jobs versus the environment and, you know, they weren't gonna, uh, you know, they didn't want to hear about it. So we uh, wrote up a citizen uh, bill of rights. Uh, the first one was uh, pretty much to ban fracking in the city. Um, and we got on the ballot in early 2013 and of course lost and then tried again in the fall of 2013. And um, we got smart in 2015. We used the primary elections to gather signatures because of course most people at the polls are registered. Um, and then, then we'd use the fall, uh, can't, uh, you know, the fall election, the general election to uh, try to get our bill passed. Um, the corporate money and the opponents, you know, er, you know, you can name a group and it was against um, you know, our movement, our, our trying to put a, a charter into, I mean, a charter into, an amendment into our charter, which is like a city constitution. And so um, we also didn't know that in 2004 at the House, at the state level, uh, HB 278 prohibited local governments from having any say in the placement of oil and gas infrastructure. And that's known as preemption. And I'm sure many people on this call have, um, you know, been exposed to that also. I mean, there's, you know, preemptive bills coming up all the time. I mean, against plastic bags, you know, protesting, um, you name it. It's, it's a way for them to, to stop citizen action before, uh, before it goes too far. Um, so uh, let's see here. So, you know, working within, trying to work within the system, you know, we realize that uh, the system is fixed and it's not working for us. And it's not that it's broken and needs to be fixed. It's that it's fixed, working fine for, um, you know, the elite few and it really needs to be, you know, broken and uh, dismantled and recreated. And, you know, myself and our organizations, community rights, rights of nature organizations, believe that all change begins at the local level. So, um, so just we, we, uh, we proposed 10, 10 bills of rights. We were on the ballot eight times, been to the Supreme Court three times. Um, uh, the one Supreme Court, when they finally decided that yes, we had to be on the ballot, it was two weeks after early voting had started. So that brought a whole nother, um, you know, bundle of uh, bundle of issues. We did do a recount one time and and came within 299 votes out of I think it's 13,000 some. So but you know, we kind of knew, you know, the whole thing of winning or losing um, has really, you know, it's a new new way to look at it now that there really are no wins or losses. It's just about being persistent and, and, you know, and keeping to speak out. Um, so in 2013, local groups around Ohio came together and formed the Ohio Community Rights Network. So we support each other. Uh, we have uh, a group in Columbus and out in the West, of course, Toledo, uh, uh, Defiance area, uh, Medina, Portage, Cleveland, down in Athens area. So we have, I think, about eight counties or nine counties now. Um, and, you know, we support each other when we can. We've also have two state amendments. One is to um, basically allow local um, groups or local regions, cities or townships to have the right to petition their government. And then there's another one, uh, well, that allows all townships and cities, because right now only cities that have charter amendments, which is like a constitution, um, can even, citizens can even propose uh, legislation. So there's, I, I can't remember, I think it was about 40% of Ohioans cannot. And again, every state is different as far as how citizens can um, access their government. So um, right now we have neither the funds or the capacity to, to run a state campaign. I think you need 600,000 valid signatures and, you know, there's, you know, 14 of us. So, <laughs> I mean, we have our groups and all that, but I mean, as far as, you know, you'd need a million dollars and, you know, that's just to get on the ballot. And then, you know, that's when the, 
the industry and the corporations and all the, you know, self-interest groups come in and, and really, uh, you know, put you down. I mean, we've had everything from flyers to radio ads to TV ads to, you know, we're, we're the job killers and, you know, but our motto in Youngstown is we don't lose until we quit. So, um, and then in 2014, the um, National Community Rights Network was formed and currently we have six states. So Oregon, Colorado, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire and Virginia just joined us last July. And so again, it's just a, it's a network where we just work to try to support each other, um, you know, in the different uh, actions that are going on. Um, you know, we all kind of believe, first we believe that the government was working for us. You know, then we believe that we could, um, you know, do these citizens make our own laws. If the government's not working, a lot of constitutions say all power is inherent in the people. And if your government is not protecting you or serving you, you have the right to amend or abolish that government. So, um, so we've, you know, come to that. And, um, you know, now we're seeing that the judicial system is really just as corrupted as, as the other uh, bodies. So, um, you know, it's, it's all about citizens and citizens at the local level and you know, networking and connecting and, and trying different approaches because you know, we all you know, have believed you know, throughout our um, trajectories that certain things might work or, oh no, that won't work. And, and now we just uh, don't. Now, I uh, did get a degree in geology and um, I was a teacher up at uh, the local university here, Youngstown State. And my late husband was a professor up there for 25 years. And, you know, he was demonized a lot, you know, as being, you know, this geologist, but being against what he should be for. And so, um, yeah, so it's, it's been a struggle. I, I have to say that I'm so grateful that we uh, met CELDEF, the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. Uh, they've assisted local and state uh, groups, you know, in with with legal help, and um, and just do some great organizing. Democracy School, which just you know blows your brain away as far as how we think our um, how we think our country was formed, and certainly that the the Quench One webinar with the um, you know indigenous perspective, and um, you know, and then the then the second webinar with the Michigan issues where. You know, people are going, wow, you know, the government not only is not protecting us, but is doing harm, uh, you know, in a criminal way. So, um, so that's about, that's what I have. Um, just, um, it's just so great to, to be here and uh, meet new people and, and connect up because we are the ones we have been waiting for. <laughs> Thank you. Susie, thank you very much for joining us. Um, like I said, you know, you have been an inspiration, Tish, Marky. Um, connecting with Seldiff was probably one of the best things that I've ever done. Um, when I got involved with the Toledoans for Safe Water, when they were putting the initiative on the ballot, I actually moved from Toledo back to Florida, but yet participated through online, which, you know, I mean, I did a lot of it online anyway. So when COVID hit, I was used to staying at home. I was already used to wearing the mask and because I was sick and I understood, you know, what these environmental toxins were doing to us, but it was hard to get it out to everybody because I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a teacher. I don't have a degree, but I knew there was many other people out there that were going through these issues and you, you couldn't just pinpoint one, but it all comes back to our water. And, you know, it was who decides it, you know, it, is it really legal to create a community that we envision, you know, 
What do we want for our communities? You know, can we say no to these harms and the practices and say yes to the sustainable ones? You know, who creates these laws? And it dawned on me, we do. We are that 1% that has the ability to speak up. Um, when I came down to Florida, I, I was gung ho on doing um, Gambor. I wanted the Gulf of Mexico Bill of Rights. My mom said, if you go big, you know, go big or stay home. And I, I was told to stay home because we needed to develop more at a local level. And if we tried at a state initiative, that we would lose. And I, I, I don't see any loss when trying to put an initiative forward like that as a loss, because any momentum to make a change in our legal system it, it is a win. Um, so by exposing what's going on in these different areas and what we can do with that and how we can move forward together collectively and put our voices together to say no, um, I think that's where we need to start at a local level. Um, Susie, you were talking about preemption. The state of Florida was preempted on four different bills, four, before it even made it to an initiative on a ballot. So they knew we were coming. Um, I, I have to give credit to Orange County um, because they did actually put a right to clean water and the citizens um, voted 89% to, to put that forward. So people are becoming aware of what our rights are to clean water and our rights for nature. And when you think about it, we're all nature. We are that fish in paradise that's flopping. And unless we make a change soon, uh, I mean, it's all gonna die. I mean, that's what, it's, it's inevitable. Um, so I, I wanna open it up for questions. So I know that I had had a few on here. Um, the first question would be for Scott. And we're gonna put the links in here um, so that you guys will know um, the, the KNAP environmental um, site on YouTube. Um, we'll also put Georgia's site on here as well as Susie's and Seldif so that they'll be in the, the link so that you guys can actually go to those. Um, Susie had also talked about the different national organization, the different states. Um, we are organizing in Florida to have a network here as well. So you can actually find out that on Facebook and that is Florida Community Rights. Um, I, I, like I said, it's time that we all band together. Um, there's 27 city or 27 counties um, within our state that are chartered and there is 406 cities. So we've got plenty of time and plenty of people um, to make this happen. So um, if you have any questions for Susie or about the right of nature, um, go ahead and put those in um, the comments and I'll get to those. But I'm gonna start with Scott. And Scott, the first question is, who or what government agency makes the decision to use these chemicals? Um, it travels down as partially with the Florida Department of Agriculture, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, but who actually signs the work orders is the Florida Wildlife Commission, the, the agency entrusted with protecting the wild places and things. And it, Scott, that's the same agency that's doing the spraying, correct? That's, they... They now subcontract out, yes, but they sign all the work orders. They do all the work plans, um, assessment studies, and so forth. For the when you say assessment studies, they're actually doing the testing for their own product to let us know it's safe. Is that what you're saying? Well, no, no, no. The DEP uh, approval, and that's what FWC always falls back on, is that 
that these chemicals are safe because they've, they've received DEP approval. What they don't tell you is that, that there is no independent testing done by the actual DEP. They use in-house science from these different chemical companies and use their science and influence and obviously money to get these DEP approvals on these, on these approved chemical classes, which there's 17 different in Florida. And some of them are, are some of them make glyphosate look like greasy kid stuff. Honestly, and there's so, some bad chemicals being sprayed in Florida. So the chemical company is actually doing the testing to tell us it's safe. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, that's crazy. Um, Scott, the second question is for you as well. And it's, um, how are residents who want to live along Florida inland lakes and rivers managing the chemical problems that give them the bug-free and weed-free environments that they want? How are they managing them? Yeah. First, or um, FWC puts a lot of weight in, in, in stakeholders that live along the lakes, but it is also perfectly legal with a 10 minute phone call for you if you are a waterfront homeowner on a lake in Florida to treat your entire lake frontage out to open water, which in some cases like on Lake Toho or the Kissimmee chain, that could be a half a mile out before you hit open water. So they're allowed to go purchase their own chemicals apply them themselves with absolutely no, uh, no experience and use, ag, you know, use chemicals that are, uh, um, uh, uh, God, what's the word I'm looking for? Tongue twisted. They, they use uh, um, some pretty harsh chemicals, let's put it that way, and are allowed to treat their own lakefront areas. And it's perfectly legal in Florida. So, so basically people can use, um, spray that is go left. by dot they can go by aquathol you can buy any of the chemical classes online on ebay now but you can go to rural king in florida and buy full strength uh uh restricted herbicide use diquat or or uh, uh, uh glyphosate at any rural king homeowner reads the label says yeah this is what works Twice as much or work twice as fast. I know Florida has the ban from June 1st until October. Are you still able to go into these stores and purchase that during that time frame that it's banned? I can take you to three of the local rural kings where I am in the Ocala area, and it's stacked up inside by the pallets in two and a half gallon bottles. You can buy all that you can afford. Kind of like the fireworks rule, you can buy them here, you just can't shoot them off. Interesting. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question. Thank you, Scott. Um, the next question is for George. Um, George, what concerns about all of this are residents raising about drinking water safety concerns? Are they drinking more bottled water, purchasing carbon filtration, reverse, reverse osmosis? Um. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a good question. Uh, there's there's a, a lot of things people are doing. Um, reverse osmosis seems to be one of the best ways to remove the contaminants, but not everybody's got two three thousand dollars laying around to put in a reverse osmosis system in their home. Um, also, when you look at the homes, you know a lot of them are are copper pipes and reverse osmosis is known as hungry water. So most people won't do the reverse osmosis except for under their kitchen sink because they don't want all their copper pipes to stop pop, you know, popping holes. Um, so they'll just basically drink and cook with that water. But a lot of these compounds in the water, they will absorb through the skin. So you may be avoiding these compounds that are showing up in the water uh, when you're drinking and, and eating and cooking and stuff, but you're taking in a pretty high doses through, uh, you know, dermal contact. Uh, one of the things I, I didn't talk about just to lend on what uh, Scott was saying was, you know, these chemicals break down. They don't just magically disappear like uh, fairy dust in the wind. 
uh, they break down to other compounds. Most of these end up coming through on uh, water testing as unregulated contaminants. Um, and if you talk to any of the, the, the municipal water treatment facilities here, uh, you know, I, like I got my, uh, my test results out and I had glyphosate in it. And uh, I think it was seven times what the WHO considers acceptable levels of uh, uh, haloacidic acids. And this was a laundry list of about 10 of them. And most of those, most of those compounds are from the degradation of different compounds coming down through the watershed and then going through a water treatment process and these compounds are formed. Um, like I said, one of them uh, that, that's kind of dangerous is NDMA. Uh, like I said, they use that in animal testing. They actually give it to animals to give them cancer. Um, and it's showing up in our waterways and it's showing up in our drinking water, uh, along with other compounds. So the unregulated contaminants are bad. Um, there's not a whole, I know there's an industry issue right now. They're talking a lot about how to get rid of these compounds out of the water. And these are, you know, much like we're sitting here talking about the problems with the water, these are top of the lot, you know, the, the PhDs and the, the, the top of the, the scientific communities trying to get together and figure out how to get these compounds out of the water because no water treatment plant can do it effectively. Uh, respectively, I think they said that they can lower the amount by 12% that show up in the water as long as they can remove precursors before water treatment. Um, so that doesn't give, give me a real warm and fuzzy feeling when it comes to living downstream of all these aquatic herbicide sprays, agricultural runoff, septic sewer, you know, so on and so on. Um, and on top of that, like I touched on before, biological application to fix our problems may exacerbate it in the short term, but be good for the long term. But in 50 years, I might not be here because I'm going to have a third eye growing out of the, you know, the middle of my forehead. Well, that's the so. one that affects, you know, our pineal gland. Um, yeah. <laughs> Reverend Kennedy, um, was asking, George, did you say that copper could have a hold with this water? No. Um, when you use, uh, I went over some research because I just recently bought myself a water filtration system. I didn't go for the reverse osmosis because it, in the industry, it's known as hungry water because so much gets removed from the water during the, the reverse osmosis treatment that when it's, it's going from that treatment um, filter system through the copper pipes, pipes in your home, it actually strips copper and anything else that's built up on the inside of that pipe away as it's going through your water and that's why you end up getting a breakdown of your copper piping and you'll get the pinhole starting. Is that similar to what happened in Flint? Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know all the details about Flint. Um, to me, what they're having issues with the metal in their water, I would say that their water is acidic. Something in there is either uh, stripping the water pipes, stripping the infrastructure, or something is breaking down in their water source um, that's leading to the elevated levels of lead. Um, geologically, I would look if there's any types of, you know, high amounts of lead in, the, um, in their source water or where it's coming from. And if it can't be isolated to that and only to infrastructure, then I would say it's a, it's a chemical issue in the water and that may be leftover components from uh, chlorination as, as in uh, disinfection byproducts or their source water is going acidic, you know, something like that. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, any, anytime that anybody's looking for like a water filtration system, I mean, that's one of the reasons that um, I got involved in like all of this online um, was, I mean, our drinking water was contaminated and I got introduced to my little water bottle 
it's a personal water bottle. I can take it wherever I go. It's NSF approved. Um, and I don't have to worry about what I'm drinking, where I go. The only bad thing is, is I can't sprinkle that for a shower. So I recommend that everybody make sure that if they're purchasing something, just make sure that it's NSF approved because you know it, you want to make sure that you're removing the toxins that you think that you are. Um, that's always important. Um, George, thank you very much. Um, our next question is for Susie, if I can get the screen to open. And Susie, they're asking what sort of guidance um, would you give to communities organizing the rights of nature policies? Yes, well, first thing is uh, just, you know, people getting together and not only discussing, you know, what are the problems, you know, what are, uh, you know, the hurdles and the things that are facing, but what do we want in our community? Um, you know, because this is about water, you know, without clean water, there is no community. Um, but, you know, in my sort of spiel, my presentation tonight, I also want to um, accentuate that, you know, you can go through all these things of, of putting your, uh, the word isn't faith, but, you know, in, in your elected officials or in the government system. And, but there are many people who spend years and years and years and really never get out of that. And, you know, I'm not saying it's, it's, it's not a worthy effort, but it also, um, it doesn't seem to find, to make any solutions or very few. I mean, once in a while, um, you know, th there will be a win and a community will, you know, stop a project. Um, a, a quick story, SELDEP, the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, uh, their lawyers started out um, representing communities that wanted to stop sewage sludge or coal ash or other things. You know, Pennsylvania was, was sort of the beginning grounds. And what would happen is the community would win, but then the industry would come back six months later with their application fixed. So if the, the I's were dotted and the T's were crossed in exactly the way they should be, then they would get the permit no matter um, no matter the opposition of people, no matter how many people showed up to the hearings, no matter how many public comments during the public comment um, were received. I know at a, the Nestle's bottling plant in, I don't remember the name in uh, Michigan, I used to uh, play the Tale of Two Cities video in one of my environmental geology classes. There were over 85,000 comments from the public opposed to Nestle being able to extract more water and, and it's still lost because the public comments, I mean, in, in most cases don't matter. So just getting over that hurdle or jumping out of the hamster wheel and realizing that, you know, it's up to, to us and our communities to create the community needs that we want. And that might mean trying to run for public office and, I know at the state level, I always say, you know, there's good people that get in there, but because the system is so fixed, they're either bought off, bullied, or silenced. And, and you know, and then um, some of the laws, the uh, fracking, the pro-fracking laws that went in, um, you know, to Ohio law were put in budget bills, uh, foreclosure bills, you know, so even though it's supposed to be one issue, one bill, you know, they'd sneak this other stuff in. So, so just having people realize that. Um, but, you know, I would say that, um, you know, the, the cell def is a good resource. The, um, I, I can write them in the chat when done the, the cell def .org. I mean, they have many, um, you know, videos and different things. Uh, you know, information is so important. And I think we've, I see that. And I, th um, you know, but over the years, I think many of us have found, uh, George probably and Scott, of course, facts don't matter. I mean, I know in the beginning we gave articles and DVDs and, you know, just thinking, oh, they're going to see this and see that 
this is a disaster. How many chemicals are and trade secret? You know, but no, it it uh, it, it it works counter to what we think. Uh, so it's all about connecting up with with people and realizing that it's up to us. Yeah. Su Susie, thank you. Learning um, the different um, paths that Zeldif have taken, um, like with the community rights in New Hampshire, um, where they had the same type of water issues and how they were able to stop those water withdrawals. You know, I, I see where it aligns with many issues that we are having here in Florida, where they have had many successes previously, you know, throughout the nation and, and, and elsewhere. So, I mean, I know that, you know, it's a paradigm shift and people are looking at this differently now that, you know, we used to always have that NIMBY approach, you know, not in my backyard. Well, guess what, neighbor? It's I'm in your backyard and that's where it's at. It's everywhere. It's not just one place or another, it's everywhere. And I see many more communities coming together and, you know, fighting for the rights of nature and, you know, their, their right to democracy and, you know, their right to free speech and voting. And I mean, there's just so many different issues that it was hard to pinpoint just one. And to say that Seldif and the, their philosophy and their teachings covers that whole umbrella, it was an eye opener for me because it made me realize you're right. We don't have a, a water issue. We don't have a fracking issue. We definitely have a democracy problem. And here in Florida, you know, they, they talk about troubled waters, blue waters, dark waters. You know, we have political waters because it's about politics and how we can change that. Um, and we, the people, will be the ones to do that um, by bringing us together, speaking out, um, you know, educating each other on different avenues that we can take and in moving together in, in one vehicle to reach that end goal is what we really need. Um, I think we have time for a few more questions. Um, so let me open up my screen here again and see what we can do. Uh, the next question, um, it looks like it's for George. Um, what are the cumulative health studies reporting about these chemical problems in the drinking water, especially for vulnerable kids, elders, people with chronic health conditions? Ah, okay. That, that's a good one. Um, and a lot of the studies that are done about the contamination that's in the water, uh, we'll take one specifically, which would be methylmercury. Um, mercury biomagnifies through the environment um, and will move up through the food chain. And um, it basically it, it, um, it, uh, it, it focuses its, its accumulation in its higher, the hierarchy in the, in the food chain. So let's say, okay, well, uh, over in Lake Okeechobee, you got a lot of bass that are eating small shiners and uh, whatever the next biggest fish is, is going to take in whatever that bass did through multiple bass. So now it biomagnifies to that top apex predator. Uh, let's say if you look at more of our saltwater estuaries, you know, we've got a lot of small uh, pinfish and feeder fish and diff just different things that by time you get out to that shark that's waiting at the end of the river, he's going to have one of the larger, higher accumulations of mercury. Same thing with barracuda uh, and fish like this. So these contaminants will move up through the food chain. Um, now, one of the things is, is about bioaccumulation within uh, somebody's physiology. And that is due to the amount of exposure. Now, there are some citations and research that suggest that the human body, depending on some characteristics, you will lose a certain amount of mercury accumulation through um, urine and uh, also breathing. 
I think you may lose some through sweating, but don't quote me on that one. Um, but you will lose some of it as it comes, as you know, you're just living. But now, to what extent can your exposure rate be offset by this, you know, ability to, to for your body to get rid of these toxins and chemicals? Um, there are studies that the mercury actually doesn't remove itself or come out of the brain um, as quickly as it would other parts of the body. Uh, there's also other chemical compounds that are opening the door through the blood brain barrier and allowing things like mercury to pass through more efficiently. So you're getting a, a larger buildup of mercury uh, inside your brain cells. Um, and this is, like I said, this is somewhere where it won't go very far, very fast. So now you start looking in at neurodegenerative uh, diseases. Um, I'd get into the BMAAs, but I may not be the best one to speak about that. I know we do have a couple scientists down here that talk about it. And that is, that almost runs parallel with mercury. And the BMAA is one of the toxins that the blue green algae cyanobacteria produce. Um, as far as growth, um, most of the studies that I saw with some of these contaminants, um, they will affect um, children throughout their growth uh, development stages uh, more intensely than they will affect a full grown adult. Um, so it really disrupts their ability to, to grow and form, uh, you know, just different aspects of, of their growth period. Uh, same thing with, uh, you know, a, a female that's carrying a baby. Uh, this is going to lead to abnormal growth. Uh, uh, growth within the, the womb and the baby's going to be born with uh, different um, deficiencies and things like that. Uh, so for the younger age brackets or uh, pregnant women, these contaminants are quite concerning, or at least I would be pretty concerned with them. Um, so there's, there's a lot to be said and there's a lot to look into. Um, but like I said, most of these contaminants are coming up as unregulated contaminants in our water sources. And we get a lot of blowback from our state and different agencies that, that don't wanna dig in or haven't released the information that they know about it. Um, I think mainly because uh, they don't wanna incite fear or, or start to have to really dig into what's the responsible parties. Where does this trail lead back to? Um, they just kind of, it's, it seems like we're almost in a, let's deal with the symptom, not the cause phase in Florida, um, which is, is kind of disheartening because, uh, it doesn't seem like it's going to end anytime soon. Uh, you're muted. Thank you, George. Um, I, I completely agree. I don't think that there is enough people telling us what's really going on. Um, a couple years ago, I remember that it was after we had had the showing for the toxic puzzle um, here in Fort Myers and the FAU had did testing um, at the St. Lucie side um, in Stewart. And everybody had tested positive for being exposed to the cyanobacteria. Um, they came over to our coast and did the same testing, um, but we didn't hear any um, results back from that. Um, I'm not sure if we ever would, but um, I, I know we have been contacted by the CDC and they are actually going, um, they're requesting people to participate in another study um, for the cyanobacteria. They are looking for 150 participants that are in the Sarasota, Fort Myers, or St. Lucie areas. So anybody that is near the Caloosahatchee, that is near Fort Myers Beach, um, Sarasota would be in near the Peace River area. Um, and I'm not sure why they're not testing near the Tampa area. Um, but if you would like to send me a message um, I would gladly love to pass that information along because, I mean, the more people that we can get participating in these, 
I mean, I know that there's been data collected everywhere, but this is here in Florida. And I think the more people that know about what's going on and the more people that participate, the more that we'll be able to speak out and people will have to listen to us. And I think that's the most important part um, is getting people to be aware and listen to us little people because it's we're the one percenters or the 99 percenters so you know we need to make sure that people understand you know because sometimes it, it does get technical and you seem like you know you're on a sci-fi movie so um i i do think that we have um bishop from flint that wanted to say something um but I'm not sure how to bring her on. Um, Bishop is one of the organizers um, from Flint. And I believe that Robert would have to bring her on or near. Yeah, she should be able to talk now. Okay, awesome. Welcome Bishop. She needs to be unmuted. Unmute. Mm -hmm. Am I unmuted now? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry, y'all. Y'all caught me when I took the emergency break. <laughs> so was there a question for me or were you referring to when I had my hand up? I thought you wanted to make the connection between Flint and what we're talking about tonight. And um, I had helped had my hand up a couple of times because he talked about the toxins in the water and that about the lead, that was just one thing that was brought out. It was so many other things in, in, in the water that were contaminant to us and to our children. And so it wasn't just one thing. When you talked about the um, Nestle and the bottled water, we went and we stood and we testified to oppose, they they pay $200 a year. We pay $200 a month for water we can't drink, water we can't cook with, water we can't bathe with, and they pay $200 a year to draw water out of our, our, our lake and then turn around and sell it back to us. How, how horrible is that? And so, and that's why it's so important that we come together and conversate. It is so important that we um, uh, communicate because your problem, our problem is not just for our community or where we are. It touches everybody. And that's why they don't want us to discuss it. Then we find out if we just work together if we put our hands together and work together and lift one another up, that we could move forward and that we could defeat the enemy, which is the government. And, and because it's not a democracy, that is not a democratic way. Many of the ways are dictatorship and we have to take back what was rightfully ours, what we, our forefathers fought for, that we could stand up and have a vote and a voice and that our vote and our voice would make a difference. And we have to stand together and do that. I completely agree, Bishop. <laughs> um, it looks like we have a question on here for George um, in regards to what he was referencing to um, on the Flint issue um, with the copper in the pipes. Um, George, it says, what's the consequences Hold on, let me open this up again. It says, what's the consequences of the copper in the pipes? They don't quite understand. I think I saw a piece of that, a bit of that question come through. I think it was in regards to uh, toxicity of that copper breaking down in the pipes. I think that that would be such a, a small amount. Uh, maybe if you're ingesting it directly, that would mess with your, your gut biome. 
because as you know, copper is, a, is an antimicrobial, or at least a, a lot of people know that. But I would think it would be a very significant amount. It's not a heavy metal. Um, more than likely, it would, it would pass through you, aside from maybe messing up your gut a little bit. I haven't really looked in the, to the copper part, just because I don't think there's ever been outrage over copper. Unless, of course, it's copper sulfite, as in uh, an algicide. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, I think we have covered all of the questions that have been asked. Um, I know that we've had a lot of people um, that have additional input you know, bacteria, um, as well. You know, with our river, our Gulf. Um, what's been happening up at Piney Point. So we'd like to continue this conversation. Um, so by all means, um, join us for the next one. And I will turn it back over to the People's Tribune uh, for closing comments. I appreciate it. And thank you for inviting us tonight to speak. Well, thank you for coming and doing this webinar. It's been really great. Um, I'm Sandy Reed. I'm with the People's Tribune. And we want to thank the speakers for their informative presentations and the audience <clears throat> for joining us. The People's Tribune is a paper of this growing movement for a society where everyone has their needs met and where everyone can lead rich, full, happy lives without these giant corporations making money off our misery. The People's Tribune publishes stories from the frontline fighters of this movement, people like what, who you saw today. Um, and um, we've been covering this fight for clean and affordable water for over a decade. We started with Detroit in their fight for affordable water and also to turn back on the water of tens of thousands of people and Flint with the uh, re demanding restitution for the poisoning and both of these struggles continue along with many others. We encourage you to join us for the next webinar which will be on June 24th and we'll deal with the wave of attempts to privatize our water uh, which is sweeping the country and was actually the cause of the poisoning of Flint that attempt to privatize the water and poisoning people in the process. Um, and we hope that the Pe People's Tribune and these webinars will contribute to helping unite a national struggle for the human right to clean water. And we thank you again for attending. Please send us any comments, stories, ideas to info at peopletribune.org. <laughs>